Good evening. Good to be with you again. It's been a great day for me. I hope it has been for you as well. Just got back from the soccer field where I had to control Edie Connell. She got really out of hand, didn't you? No, she didn't. Had a good time out there being windblown. And I was standing away from the bleachers. Uh, anytime I go to a sporting event, most of the time, I try to sit away from fans, away from the, the stands. And it's no offense to any of you if you're at the game, but uh, all my years as a coach, I don't really want to sit around fans. I, it's, you know, uh, that's just, right, coach? You the same way? I just, I, I think that when I was coaching basketball, I felt like people needed to take a test before they came into the game because a lot of times the things that they were shouting made no sense and, you know, but we're completely biased as fans, aren't we? We talked about that this morning, and I want to continue that tonight in Matthew chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Those of you who have been with us regularly know that we are studying some messages from Matthew to go along or coincide with what our young people are learning in LTC and what they'll be tested on in a few weeks at Bible Bowl. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the parable of the sower. Tonight, we're going to look at the wheat and the tares. Getting back to what I was saying about fans, we talked this morning about fair weather fans, about enthusiasts, about admirers of Jesus, and how so many times they have the appearance of being true followers when in actuality they are not. And we're going to look at that tonight with the wheat and the tares as well. But the thing about fans is they can be very passionate about their team. They can be so passionate that, as we said this morning, they can act very abnormal, even outrageous at times. And we see that so many times at little kids' games. You know, that little kid's soccer game a while ago, watching Lane and Zane play against each other. And, you know, some of your more rabid fans are at peewee games or little league games. And uh, I, I was refereeing one time at, uh, at the peewee level. I had more complaints and more problems from parents at the little league or peewee level than I ever did when I was refereeing high school games. But people can get very enthralled in the game, especially when they have a stake in it. When their son or daughter is playing, they get so enthralled that they can act outrageous at times. Now, so many times we see in the world around us, we make two distinctive groups. We have your Christians and your pagans. And that's how we see the world. You know, you have these people that are sheep and goats. And, and certainly that's a biblical concept. But many times... There's a little bit of a gray area in that you have some people that give the appearance of being a Christian, when in actuality, that's all it is, is a facade. We'll talk about that a little bit tonight. Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain... Then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barns. Now, I think the explanation to this parable is pretty self-explanatory. You know, Jesus is saying that while the seed, the good seed is scattered in the world, while the message is scattered, there will be an evil one, Satan, who is sowing a counter-sowing. We have to exist with those in the world who do not have Christ's best interest. We have to deal with Satan in this world. And as we see here, with the truth, there will spring up other things, false doctrines, false teachings, and things of that nature. There will spring up those people who have believed in those things, and right along with Christians, there will be the result or the fruits of those who did not accept the Word of God and planted and allow it to take root in their heart. Now, once we scratch below the surface, we find out a whole lot more to this parable. As we said, a couple of Sundays ago, we talked about the parable of the sower. 
And we talked about what it meant to not just be a listener, but a doer. James said to prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who dilute themselves. In other words, the one who is an effectual doer is the one that allows the word to be implanted in their heart. They're not just a listener. They take what they have heard and they apply it to their life and they do something about it. As we said, it's not just what you know, it's about what you do with what you know. And we talked about the the four kinds of soils, right? You had the wayside soil, you had the rocky soil, you had the thorny soil, and then, of course, you have the good soil. And we want to be the good soil. We want to be the kind of soil or heart where the Word can take root, and it can sprout up, it can grow, and it can produce fruit. If you do not allow, or if you do not uh, uh, water and let the the, the Word germinate in your heart, it's not going to take root. And I don't care what you're trying to grow. If it doesn't have roots, it's not going to produce fruit. That brings us to this evening. Once we have looked into the mirror that is God's Word, once we have examined ourselves by God's Word, once we have heard what it has to say and applied it to our lives, we must be changed by it. The good soil or the good heart is the one that is cultivated. The weeds are destroyed. The rocks are removed. The soil is cultivated. It's it's tendered. It's, It's taken care of so that the best possible growth can occur. You know, an important strategy, I think, to combating combating the devil is understanding how he works. I think it's important to know something about the devil. I think it's important to know your enemy. And so for just a few moments tonight, I'll ask you to do something a little strange. Put yourself in the devil's position. If you were the devil, who would you go after? You may say to yourself, well, I'd go after that hardcore Christian, somebody like Jake, you know, he's teaching Bible class, he's raising a Christian family, he's a wonderful man of God, that's the person I would go after. But you know, those folks are hard to get to. Those folks may be beyond reaching if you're the devil, and you may say to yourself, you know, that's, that's too hard of a project. You may pass on that. You may say, well, I'd go after the person who has fallen away. Or the person who never became a Christian in the first place, the worldly person that has no desire to become a child of God, that's the person I would go after. But you know, that's an easy target. You already have them anyway, right? So why mess with them? You know, I think if I were the devil, you know who I'd go after? I'd go after that Christian that seemed to have it all figured out. They're here every Sunday and Wednesday. They sit in the pew, they sing along. Maybe even they serve the congregation in some some shape or form. But behind closed doors, they're anything but a Christian. It's that prim and proper lady that seems to have her world all in order. But at home, in the privacy of her four walls, she's doing things that are completely and totally immoral. She's cheating on her husband. You've got that guy that's maybe an elder. Maybe he's the preacher. He's a fine, upstanding man by all appearances, but he's addicted to pornography. Those are the people, I think, that I would probably seek out and go after. The ones who had that religious facade, and I would try to expose that. I realize that tonight, in some ways, I'm talking to tares. There may be some in the audience. I don't want you to fear what I'm going to say, but hopefully you'll be encouraged by it and want to change and want to seek a better path and have that good heart that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. You know, in the botanical world, a tear is also referred to as a bearded darnel. I would give you the Latin name, but I'm afraid I would butcher it. Well, here goes. Loleum tumultum. Does that sound right? Anybody got a green thumb? Okay, good. Then, yes, I'm right. You know I am. This is a poisonous ryegrass that is very common in the East. And according to ancient Jewish philosophy, they believed that the earth, the soil, was corrupt before the flood. And that these tares would spring up because the earth was guilty of fornication. It was a corrupt earth and it produced these tares. But what's really interesting about this bearded darnel or this tear is that it looks exactly like wheat. In fact, it's just a degenerate form of wheat. The only way 
to distinguish between the wheat and the tare is after it is grown to maturity and it's time to harvest it. You see, when it comes to the bearded darnel or the tare and the wheat, they are exactly the same in size, but it, the darnel is gray in color. It's also very noxious and poisonous, semi-poisonous anyway. The problem is that by the time one can make a distinction between this bearded darnel and the wheat, they've already grown together. And as they grow together in the field, their roots become intertwined. So that if you were to go out and pull them up like you would your garden, you're inevitably going to tear up the wheat too. Now obviously this poses a problem because the bearded darnel can take away nutrients and water and things that that the wheat needs to grow properly and to produce fruit. It is a thief in every way. It steals the nutrients that the wheat so desperately needs. And so the only way to eradicate the darnel is through the harvest. Once you've harvested both, it's easy to tell between the, heat, the wheat and the tare. But of course, by this time, some of the wheat has been lost because the tare has stolen the nutrients. As I said a while ago, if we're not careful, we tend to divide people into two major groups, not realizing that on the spectrum between, between a pagan and a Christian, there are those who may give all the appearances of being a true child of God, a true follower even, but underneath, they're anything but. Earlier in the book of Matthew, you'll remember that Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. I want you to notice the very terms that Jesus uses. The false prophet is a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's a subtle difference. It's hard to tell. Like the wheat and the tare, they look exactly the same. But you will know them by their fruit. Same with the wheat and the tare. You will know a false prophet by their fruit. You will know a false prophet by what they're saying, by what they're producing. You know, the difference is so subtle. But when it comes to a false prophet, you've got to look for that zipper, right? You've got to look for the zipper on his costume because it's just, a, it's just a sheep costume. Underneath, he's a wolf. And you see, if he was coming out and saying, there, there is no such thing as God and Jesus never died on a cross, well, you, you wouldn't believe that. You could dismiss that easily, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about the one that seems really sincere. The one who actually preaches some truth. The one who gives you just enough truth to whet your appetite. But then his teachings go off in a different direction. He massages the scriptures. He does some word tricks. He messes with semantics a little bit. And sometimes just gets way off base, but he pulls people in. He draws them in. Maybe he's a smooth talker. Maybe he pours honey in their ears, but he gets them to listen, and he fills them with things that are not true. He sows a seed that is not a good seed. But it's a very subtle difference, and we must be very careful. That's why Jesus said beware. He wouldn't have to say beware if it was somebody speaking, you know, all these untruths that we know are wrong. It's the one that's got a slick tongue. It's the one that can say things in a way that sounds so true when in actuality it is so false. Jesus approaches the same subject in Matthew chapter 23. Here he exposes the Pharisees for who they really are. You know, they were considered to be the religious elite, those who were closer to God than anybody else. And Jesus, of course, points out that they are not, that their appearances are deceiving. The scribes and the Pharisees, he said, have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. In other words, the, Pharisee knew, the Pharisees knew God's word, but they didn't do God's word. Like we talked about a couple of weeks ago. They heard it, but they didn't do anything with it. Verses 27 and 28 of Matthew 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. 
So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You know, a man's service to God is of no value if the inside is not pure and clean. We've said before, you can, you can gloss the outside, you can spit shine it, you can do whatever to make it as pretty as possible. But it's, what on, it's what's on the inside that counts. It's not the outer shell or the coating that dictates what is truly righteous. It's what's on the inside. And if what's on the inside is pure, then what is on the outside will be as well. That'll take care of itself. Now, here are some facts about wheat that we need to understand. We talked a little bit about tares, the subtle difference. What we know about wheat is that it grows very rapidly. It matures quickly and then it's gone. And that's much like us. You know, on the scope of eternity, on the radar screen of eternity, we are just a blip. James says, you know, for what is your life? You know, you're but a vapor. You appear for a little while and then you vanish. You are gone. We are here for only a short time. Therefore, we'd better make the most of our time. We'd better spend it wisely. We'd better be seeking to produce fruit while we are here because we don't know how much time we actually have. Here's something else we know about wheat. If you've ever seen wheat growing on the side of the road in some field, you know that it bows. It bows over after a while, doesn't it? When it reaches maturity, that's because the head is heavier and it causes it to bend over. We should be bowing in our service to God every single day. We should be seeking to humbly serve Him in all that we do. We are never more powerful than when our heads are bowed and we are on our knees before God. That is when we are at our strongest. Don't believe me? Read through the Old and New Testament and see how many people went to God for strength on their knees. We have many resemblances to wheat, and this, this parable speaks to us when we understand the difference between a wheat and a tear, and we understand what Jesus is saying here to us, to bear fruit for the Lord means that the seed has been planted and the desired outcome has been achieved. It's a Christian growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and not only maturing but producing fruit as well, producing other Christians. We are bearing fruit when we reflect the character of Christ and when we go out into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What a man is, he is bound to show. Jesus makes this very clear in Matthew 7, 16 through 20. You will know them by their fruits, he says. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Same with the wheat and the tares. They both grow up together. They reach maturity. Then they're harvested. And what happens to the wheat? It's thrown into the barns. What happens to the tares? It's thrown into the fire. It's burned. And you think about the implications there, folks. That's not sugar-coated, is it? There is an expectation for the wheat. There is an expectation for the one who has had the good seed and planted in their heart. We cannot simply decide to, to rest on our faith, to do nothing with it. We can't decide to say, well, I'm a Christian now. That's good enough for me. And one of the things that we discussed this weekend at our leadership retreat was how we, can, how we can spur ourselves and the congregation on to, to be better in their individual lives, to seek to be better Christians in their individual lives. You know what one of the difficulties is because of that? You know why that is so hard, I should say? It's because I've learned that most folks feel like that they have a level of commitment that's good enough. 
Everybody's level of commitment is different. But I've noticed that a lot of folks feel like my level of commitment is enough. I come to church on Sunday morning. I may not go on Sunday night. I may not go on Wednesday night, but I come on Sunday morning. I mean, that's better than a lot of people, better than most people. Their level of commitment is there. They think that's good enough. Some that would even say, I come to church, you know, once a month. That's, that's good. I mean, it's better than nothing, right? Some that say, you know, I come to church every time the doors are open. I may not do much in my personal life, but, I, you know, I'm here every time the doors are open. That's enough, right? Everybody's level of commitment seems to be different. And as we said this morning, it makes us feel better when we compare to somebody else. Well, at least I'm better than this person. At least I've got it figured out here. And somebody like James McCoy, who is an upstanding elder, well, I'll never reach that level anyway. That's, that's him. That's not me. And so we make excuses. We justify our lack of commitment by believing that our level of commitment is enough. And as we said this morning, God demands our best. He demands excellence. My part of the retreat this weekend was talking about existing versus excelling. You want to just exist, or do you want to excel? Every time our Lord required an offering, what did he demand? The best. And so many times we give him the leftover. Let's don't be a people that give them the leftovers. Let's don't be a people who, who look good on the outside, but on the inside, we're very lacking. Let's don't be a people who puts on a good facade, but when it gets right down to it, there's not much substance. You know, one of the things I like to eat at Rose's is sopapillas. You ever have their sopapillas? Yeah, some of your stomach is growling right now. I can hear it. The thing about sopapillas is they're all puffed up and they look all plump and juicy and you, you cut into them and what's on the inside? Nothing but air. We don't want to be that way. We don't want to be a people that looks really good on the outside. Man, we got it all together on the outside, but inside we're just empty. We want to be full of service. We want to be people who are full of the Lord that he has consumed us and we are obsessed with giving him our all, giving him our best. And we understand that because we give our best in so many other things in life. We understand the concept. We can't plead ignorance here. We understand what it means to give our best in so many things. Certainly we understand what it means to give our best to God and not simply leftovers. You know, I say all of this to say that it's relatively easy for one to think that they're wheat when in actuality they may be a tear. There are many individuals, I think, that are self-deceived. Many Christians that are going to bed each night believing a lie. Believing that their level of service or their level of commitment is enough when in actuality they just look like wheat on the outside. Sad, but I believe that that's true. Maybe they obeyed the gospel at one point, but they're sporadic in their obedience. Maybe they wear the name Christian, but they don't carry out the name in their daily lives. Maybe they profess to love Christ, but their actions don't match that profession. Maybe they bow their heads, but not their hearts. Maybe they claim allegiance to God, but they're not really faithful. Maybe they tweak themselves, but they don't have a wholesale change in their heart. Maybe they listen to the Word, but they don't allow it to take root. You know, obviously, when presented with the choice of being wheat or a tear, we want to be wheat, right? We want to be people who are producing fruit, not those people that when the harvest comes, we find out that we are empty, that we are semi-poisonous, that we're noxious ryegrass. We don't want to be separated and thrown into the fire. We want to be people who have sought to carry out the character of Christ in the world and seek to make other disciples. 
next quarter, we're going to leave you with very little excuse. We're going to talk about growing the kingdom on Wednesday night in class. So those of you who struggle with that, and I know we have some. I know we have many folks that, that wonder, you know, I, I want to carry out the Great Commission, but I'm not real sure how. I need a plan. I need a strategy. We're going to talk about next quarter growing ourselves so that we can grow others. You know, we can sit out here on the southeast portion of town and we can exist or we can excel. We can go out into the world and carry out the mission that God expects us to carry out. We can be wheat or we can simply be tares. We can look good to the world around us. We can have a really glossy finish, but inside have no substance. Obviously, we know what we would choose and what we would rather be like. What a man is, he is bound to show. What do you have to show for your commitment and your dedication to Jesus Christ? Words aren't enough. Not enough just to talk about it and say how much you love him. The proof is in the pudding, as they say. Church attendance isn't enough. Just being baptized isn't the end. We have work to do. And you never retire from that work. Let me throw that in there. Sometimes I hear some of our more mature Christians say, you know, well, I've done my part. It's time for somebody else to do it. No, you don't retire. You've still got work to do as well. I don't see any Christians in the Bible that retired. Be faithful unto death. We've got to keep working and keep working until we leave this earth or until Christ comes back. And I hope that we all make that our mission, that we all seek to be everything that we need to be and that we can be so that the Lord's Church that meets here at Oldham Lane will be highly successful. You know, I come from northeast Arkansas, as you know. I've told you before that my dad was a farmer all his life. I spent half of my upbringing, you could say, on a farm. We had a family farm in south Arkansas. And occasionally, my dad would grow wheat. Northeast Arkansas, Greene County, is the number two leading rice-producing county in the world. And just south of it, Craighead County is number one. That's where Riceland Foods is located. And so rice is the number one crop. But my dad would occasionally grow wheat. I was talking to my dad the other day in preparation for this lesson. We were talking about the ins and outs of growing wheat and all that because I was so young, I didn't pay attention. And he said, the interesting thing about wheat is that it will sprout up and you will actually have stalks of wheat that look like they're mature. But you break open the head and there's nothing in it. These are called blanks. Very similar to what we've been talking about tonight. I thought that was interesting. And that sheds some more light on what we've been talking about. We don't want to be a blank. We want to be a fruit-producing stalk of wheat. What's also interesting is that in northeast Arkansas, there's a certain time of year where you can smell smoke in the air. You can see it because people are burning off their wheat fields. Do they do that here? They burn off the straw, the excess, after they've harvested it, and they burn off those blanks. They burn it all off so that they can do it all over again the next season. You know, there is there's a very sobering realization there when you look at what Jesus is talking about and how the wheat and the tares will be separated and how some will be stored and some will be burned. Obviously, we want to be that wheat that is producing a bountiful harvest. Are you bearing fruit for Christ in your life? You heard me say it a couple of weeks ago. There are a lot of evangelism plans out there. There are a lot of them that are really worthy, that are pretty good. And many times churches adopt these evangelism plans to spur their congregation on to give them kind of a, uh, a unified approach to reaching out to the lost. 
We've even done some of those in places I've been before, but I still believe the only way, the only evangelism plan, I should say, that really, really works is for each and every one of us to make it our personal mission to go and seek and save the lost. Until each and every one of us in this congregation make that our mission, we're not going to produce fruit. Because you can put together a program, and like with many things in the church, 10% of the people will do it while 90% choose not to participate. Until we all make it our personal mission to carry out the Great Commission and not the Great Omission, we will not be successful. Are you producing fruit in your life? Remember the plus two that we've got in the bulletin, the challenge that I gave all of us this year. That's a simple way to at least get your foot in the door. Do your neighbors even know you're a Christian? Have you even invited your neighbors to church? I mean, that's easy, right? We all know two people that we could easily invite to church and let that be a springboard to perhaps planting the seed. Make it your goal. Make it your mission. And on top of that, or with that, be Christ-like in your daily life. Not just giving the appearance of it, but exhibiting his character in everything that you do. God expects and demands your best. He gave his best for you, his son. What are you going to give for him? You know, if you're sitting here tonight and you're a tear, maybe you've never put on Christ in baptism and you know what you need to do, then it's time. Don't risk being pulled up with the wheat and being burned. Be a child of God right now. Maybe you're a tear in that you've put on Christ in baptism at some point in your life, but you're hollow and empty inside. You haven't been maturing, growing as you should. Somewhere along the way, your growth has been stunted. Let us pray with you. Let us help you. Whatever your need is, come now as we stand and as we sing.